For so many people, the first thing that they'll say is, I felt like I was destined to have issues with my memory because my mother or my grandmother did. Mm -hmm. And I've really been trying to break down that barrier and help people realize that while your genes play into that role, it's really your habits and your lifestyle that impacted the most. I heard this quote from Dr. Mark Hyman, who's big into aging and longevity. And he said, your genes load the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Welcome to Aging in Style with me, Lori Williams. I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe you can follow your dreams at any age. My grandmother's journey with dementia ignited a passion in me to work with seniors. I've spent the past 13 years learning about seniors and aging. In my mid-50s, I followed my own dream and founded my company, where I use my expertise to help seniors locate housing and resources. On this podcast, we cover all aspects of aging. Join us each week to meet senior living experts and inspirational seniors who are following their dreams. The fact is, we're all aging, so why not do it in style? Hi, welcome to today's episode of Aging in Style. So if you follow the podcast, you know that we have talked about all different types of therapies and services for seniors, including physical therapy and occupational therapy. But the one that we have not addressed yet is speech therapy, and it is so important. So I have a wonderful guest today that I'm going to introduce you to. Her name is Francine Waskovitz. I hope I said that right. Good. Good. She is the owner and head coach at Longevity Coaching. She's a speech language pathologist and a certified health and nutrition coach. And she's dedicated to helping older adults and seniors maximize their long-term memory and cognitive health. So her mission is to help raise awareness on the importance of memory health, and to guide seniors in taking early action to support their mind and memory as they age so they can stay ahead and thrive in their lives that they've worked so hard to create. Francine also is a creator of the Memory Wellness Wheel Assessment, and we'll get into what that is. And she uncovered how to use the power of food and lifestyle to nourish, heal, and thrive. Her programs are designed to help older adults and seniors overcome and prevent memory loss. That is so important. So thank you, Francine, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, before we jump into speech therapy and what that is, Tell us how you decided to work with seniors. What brought that on? What inspired you? You know, it's interesting because I didn't grow up around seniors. I didn't have grandparents that I got to really meet or that lived nearby. And so I never really got exposed to seniors until I was in graduate school. And I was, you know, being placed in working in peds, working in geriatrics. And I just fell in love with it. I'm a little bit of an old soul. And so I think that their stories and their pace of life just resonated with me. And I've loved it ever since. I've been doing it for 10 years now. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, for people who don't know what speech therapy is, can you just define what it is? Tell us a little bit about speech therapy. Absolutely. So I think it's one of those areas that most people don't really realize extends to working with adults, but the the scope of a speech pathologist is pretty wide. So if somebody is experiencing difficulty with their swallowing or dysphagia, that falls under the role of a speech and language pathologist. If somebody has had a traumatic brain injury or a stroke and they're having issues with their language and their communication, that falls under the role of a speech and language pathologist. Anything with cognition, so executive functioning, decision-making, problem-solving skills, that's also the role of an SLP. And then, of course, the area of memory health, so working with people who are showing mild signs and symptoms of difficulty with their memory all the way to late stage and end-of-life services with dementia. You know, we kind of do it all there. So we hear a lot, like when senior has had a stroke, that that is part of their therapy, that they will have speech therapy. So obviously that is one of the benefits of speech therapy. So how do you work with someone who's had a stroke? Well, it really depends. So a lot of the times right in the hospital, they'll end up having services for speech. And it really depends on what was impacted, right? Because when you have a stroke, depending on where that was in the brain, um, it'll have different effects on your communication and your swallowing. 
My process, though, being in independent living, assisted living, was always that once they returned from rehab, we would start working with them immediately on their language and communication and their swallowing. And it really had to do with what's most functional to them and what level were they at. Some people lose all communication with a stroke. Some people end up with aphasia. And that's where they're having difficulty either with comprehension of language or expression of language. And so you really start getting into the nitty gritty of the language and working on it bit by bit. Again, it varies drastically Mm -hmm. depending on what signs and symptoms somebody's having since their most recent stroke. But it's really getting into the language and communication, trying to restore function as much as possible. And when you can't restore function, how can we compensate to help them be as independent as possible? Oh, that's great. What kind of things do you do if you can't restore enough of their speech? What do you, what tools are offered to help them compensate for that? So there's a lot of different things we can do. We can work with the communication partners to set up visual supports where they have even like a booklet that has little prompts or pictures. And if they have no language, can they point? You know, going to work on receptively? What can we work on to help them express themselves, even if it's nonverbal? And then from there, we can build up. So if somebody has aphasia, we start working with um, visual supports that can help them really get their message across a little bit better. There's also technology that you can use. People can use a tablet where they push certain buttons and it kind of speaks for them or helps them convey their message. So there are a lot of different tools that you can employ to help somebody communicate after a stroke. Okay, great. And then the big question that I'm sure everyone has is how is speech therapy paid for? So speech therapy, similar to physical therapy and occupational therapy, is covered under Medicare services so long as it's medically necessary. And there's a lot of things that can qualify it as medically necessary. So, of course, um, an event or an injury, like a traumatic brain injury, a stroke, would qualify you for services. But also the move into a new community. If somebody's having memory issues and they've been living at home and now they've moved into a community, you often find that their memory issues will worsen with that change of environment. And that's a change in medical status that would qualify somebody to have speech therapy services. So it is covered under Medicare. Um, There are some limitations with private pay programs or um, with private insurance that there's some limitations on the frequency of visits or the pre-authorization required for visits, but it's usually covered in some capacity. Okay, great. And kind of jumping to another topic, I know... um, You do a lot of research and work with aging and memory health and speech. So how does that all work together? So I've really been spending the last 10 years working on memory, right? Being in assisted living and an independent living, a lot of my job was working with people with memory dysfunction. And that went all the way from those early signs of um, having more difficulty, you know, remembering that I have a doctor's appointment or staying organized all the way to late stage dementia. And I really, simultaneous to doing all of this, I was going on my own health journey and I did a ton of research on my own. I I read countless books on the topic of nutrition and movement and lifestyle and how it affects our health. And I started to have this little seed planted in my head about what would happen, just what if we were reaching people earlier? And we could reach people when they were starting to have those really subtle early signs of a change in their memory or cognitive function, what would happen. And so I just kind of ran with it after that. I uh, put myself back in school, which was something I said I would never do. (laughs) Um, And I really started piecing together everything I knew about memory health and strategies and systems that can improve memory when there's already a problem. And I really married it with what I was learning about nutrition and coaching and making small sustainable changes and movement and stress and sleep. And I created a program around all of that so that it would holistically approach memory health so that people could age in place longer or, you know, just stay as independent for as long as possible or even just overcome those senior moments that start having that nagging fear of, is this going to progress to something more? Mm -hmm. So I I love that. 
Explain a little more. So like if you have a, or maybe you have an example of someone you've worked with, but if you have someone make an appointment with you to come and and, um, get evaluated and start using these techniques, what does that entail? Sure. So you mentioned in the beginning, I created this assessment. It's called the Memory Wellness Wheel. And what it is, is it's the eight elements involved in supporting memory resilience as you get older. And what we do is we go through one by one and we rate how they're doing in each of those elements. And what it does is provides us with a visual of where their slow leaks are. And then we can go one by one through through coaching because it's a one-on-one coaching program. Mm -hmm. We can start plugging those holes a little bit and supporting those systems one by one, one piece at a time so that they get back in control of their memory. And typically the process is somebody will call me I go through, I do a free call where I just listen to a little bit about what's going on. We see if we're a good fit, if my program could help them. I tell them more about the program and then we dive right in and mm-hmm. we start the assessment and then I do coaching with them. Oh, great. So what are the eight elements that you're looking for? Sure. So they are stress, sleep, movement, nutrition, environment, support, attention, and learning. Okay. I could see how leaks and any of those, as you put it, could cause, you know, memory issues. So, you know, if they're not eating properly, they're not moving at all or, or having stress or, and not socializing, all of those, I can see where that would lead to, to dementia. So once you have someone on the program, start implementing the changes, are you seeing a big difference in their memory? Are they seeing a difference? Yes. For so many people, the first thing that they'll say is I felt like I was destined to have issues with my memory because my mother or my grandmother did. Mm -hmm. And I've really been trying to break down that barrier and help people realize that while your genes play into that role, it's really your habits and your lifestyle that impacted the most. I heard this quote when I was at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition from Dr. Mark Hyman who's big into aging and longevity. And he said, you know, your genes load the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And so a lot of people, it's that immense relief that they have some control. Mm -hmm. And with small changes that we're making, specifically starting with nutrition and movement, people start seeing improvements so quickly, like within a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Because their eating habits could be promoting inflammation and inflammation is the root cause of all disease. And so it causes that brain fog that settles in over time and makes, makes the thoughts feel less automatic and the Mm -hmm. words stuck on the tip of your tongue or the thoughts just kind of, you lose your train of thought all the time. That's brain fog really hard at work there. And so they do start seeing improvements relatively quickly once they're in my world and we're working through this program. That's wonderful. I think that's that's so inspirational for people because like you, I mean, most of the people I talk to, I get a lot of uh, who say, well, you know, my mom had dementia, so I'm going to have it, you know, and it's it's like, you don't necessarily have to have it. It's like my father had, you know, heart disease, but, you know, his lifestyle choices were to smoke and not eat right and a lot of stress. So, you know, like you said, there's so many things like, yes, you may have it genetically, it's, it's in your genes, but there's things you can do. And especially now, there's more and more things that we can do to prevent it from happening. So that's wonderful. What are some things you had mentioned about taking early action? So if someone is noticing some cognitive health, you know, maybe some brain fog, what are some early things they can do to address it? Sure. The first thing I would always recommend is speaking with your physician. You know, you've had a lot of people on this podcast about um, you sharing rates of dementia and also Mm -hmm. discussing that topic of mild cognitive impairment. It is critical and it's underdiagnosed. And it's something that if you're experiencing those subtle changes, even if it's not mild cognitive impairment, if it's just subjective and only you are noticing it right now, it's still critical to mention it to your healthcare provider just to get on the same page. Other than that, I would say really starting to increase your awareness you know, okay, brain fog is settling in. How? What is it impacting? How often is it happening? You can't improve something when you don't fully understand what's happening 
when, when it's happening. And so really starting to become hyper aware and vigilant about taking note of those moments that you're getting stuck or feeling that brain fog settle in. And then with taking early action, finding support, you know, to letting letting your family know a little bit about what you're doing, you know, taking your healthcare provider in on this with you. And then if you're still struggling, seeking out a service that can support you and guide you through what to do next, because it can feel overwhelming. Mm-hmm. If people will spend time researching and we know Google can be like your best friend or <laughs> enemy, but they'll hop on there and it's like, there's so many things I can be doing, but where do I start? And mm-hmm. so, having, you know, support to help you with where to start and how to make those changes is really valuable. Do you also find that a lot of people, they don't want to say anything. They know something's going wrong. It's not quite right, but they don't want to bring it up and acknowledge it. It's maybe a little bit of denial or they just... They're going to ignore it or they're so stressed out about it that they don't want to tell anyone they're trying to hide it. Do you find that too? Yes, absolutely. And masking and denial are part of memory change. Mm -hmm. That's actually in the early stages, you'll start to see that. But it's empowering when you tell people, you know, we're here for you and we can support you. And, you know, I've had people come to me that say like, I don't don't want to tell my family. And I tell them it can be our little secret. Let's just... Mm -hmm start taking action here. And really when they start opening up about it, sometimes even just getting it off your chest to somebody, um, especially someone who's not around you, like not a family member, but a healthcare provider or, you know, a coach like myself, it it helps them breathe that sigh of relief. Like, okay, now, now I've opened the door to talking about this. I think I can talk about it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you could just define for our audience, mild cognitive impairment, what does that exactly mean? And what are the signs of that? Sure. So I'm actually, if I may, I'm going to take it a step ahead of that, where somebody's having a subjective memory change. That is when you're noticing those chronic moments of forgetfulness, that brain fog, thoughts feeling less automatic, and you are noticing it. It's happening enough that each time it happens, it's like, there it goes again. But the people around you aren't quite noticing it yet. Mm Mm-hmm. If that is left unaddressed, it pro- it progresses or can progress into a mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment is really when somebody is having difficulty with their memory and their thinking that is not yet affecting their functionality. They're still able to manage their household or their finances or to drive. And it's not necessarily impacting familiar routines, but it might change the way that they're able to express themselves. So word finding might become more challenging or they might find that they've missed an appointment here or there. And now the people around them are starting to notice those changes as well. Mm-hmm. And you know, as we learned, and I know, again, you've, you've talked about this on your podcast before, mild cognitive impairment can be a precursor to dementia. It's not dementia, but Mm -hmm. it can progress if it's not addressed. Okay. So if someone comes to you and say they, they do have mild cognitive impairment, you would start with them, you would go through the wheel, just kind of plug the leaks, like you said, but do you see like a reversal in it for them? Or tell me kind of how that works and how long, I guess it's individual, but how long does that typically take? Yes, absolutely. I have a process where I go through those eight elements and I always, always start with nutrition and sleep and stress. And typically within a few weeks, even focusing in on just those few things can really make all of the difference because not only are you targeting what's going in the body that could be causing that inflammation Mm -hmm. that certainly isn't helping, but also you're giving them focus right? Because we talk about new learning and we talk about brain exercise. There is no better brain exercise than doing something functional that breeds more connection and gets you thinking. And so trying a new recipe is a great way to get your mind moving, but it's also a tool that you can be using to prevent inflammation, to overcome your high blood pressure, um, to help you get more in touch with the way that you're feeling with the foods that you're eating. And so I do start to see that people can overcome that mild cognitive impairment or certainly improve it mm-hmm. with even just you know four or five weeks within the program. Yeah, we've had a guest on before who talked about foods that we should all be eating like now <laughs> to prevent it. But I believe they were blueberries, strawberries, walnuts, salmon, and there was one other. 
maybe kale. I can't remember. But does that sound about right? Or those yes. type of things, <laughs> the brain so, foods? So dark leafy greens are mm-hmm. incredible for your system. Um, but also, like you mentioned, those blueberries that have the polyphenols and the antioxidants, and they can kind of help reduce inflammation. But eggs is another good one. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a lot of brain healthy foods out there, but mm-hmm. you did list quite a few, like the salmon. Chia seeds are another good one. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. So those are what we all need to be eating. I'm telling myself this too. <laughs> I, I do. I have been trying since uh, I had him on the podcast, you know, every time, like I need my blueberries, I need uh, chia seeds is good. I'm going to add some of those too. So I know yeah. that that helps with inflammation, right? Yeah. And they've got, they're full of omega-3s. So if you're looking for another way to get a healthy dose of omega-3s, it's a good source. Okay, very good. And, you know, I know inflammation is, I mean, it is so tied to what we eat. And of course, sugar is a huge one. What are the other things that kind of raise the inflammation food wise uh, in our bodies? So there's a lot of inflammatory oils. It's really those highly processed foods Mm -hmm. going into your system. And it's not, it's a combination effect, right? We live in a high stress society. We're eating on the go and all of that combined with the low quality foods that we're consuming regularly can breed inflammation in the body. And like we said, inflammation is the root cause of all disease. Mm -hmm. So typically when I'm working with somebody, one of the first things that I tell them is we need to know your numbers. What are your numbers? And let's take the stigma away Mm -hmm. in a non-judgmental way. Is your weight healthy? Is your blood pressure healthy? Are you diabetic? Because a lot of those things can facilitate disease when they, we have these chronic low levels of Mm -hmm. dysfunction for so long, they can really not help our case. If we are, you know, if we have a family history of something like dementia. Yeah, exactly. This is such great information. I just, I love having you on the podcast. I'm glad that you reached out to me and and noticed that we had not had a speech therapist. So this is even just beyond because all the other stuff you're doing, not just speech therapy, but with your own program. And I know that you're in South Carolina. So is your program, do you need to be in South Carolina or can you help anyone in the U.S.? I do my program virtually so that I can see people all over, which has been really fun. Great. So if someone wanted to reach out to you, how would they find you? Sure. So they can go to my website, francinewaskovitz.com. I know that's a little tricky to spell. (laughs) (laughs) We'll put it in the podcast information (laughs) so they can find you. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a link on there to book a free 30 minute call with me so that we can discuss somebody's challenges and see if I'm a good fit with my program. But also I have some free resources on my website as well. I have the beginner's guide to strengthening your mind as you age, which they can download. And that helps with overcoming those senior moments. It gives you a four step process for that and a little bit of insight into strengthening the mind beyond brain games. Mm -hmm. I also have a blog where I've been putting out some information on mild cognitive impairment, um, empowering people that memory loss is preventable, that memory loss is not a normal part of aging and Mm -hmm. that we can be taking action on it. And, uh, you know, just some other little tips and tricks on there for improving your exercise. So those are a couple of resources and good ways to connect with me. Great. Well, excellent. Oh, we did also mention, so speech therapy is covered by Medicare, but unfortunately when something is preventative, like what your program is, it is not. So your program is private pay, correct? It is. It's private pay only. Like you said, unfortunately, Medicare does not yet see the value of preventative health services, but really I'm always telling people investing in your health now can actually save you a lot of out of pocket down the road. So yes, Mm -hmm. it's it's an investment, but I don't think there's any better investment than in yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. If it helps you, you know, live the life that you want to in this Mm -hmm. next chapter, then yeah, have a better quality of life. And yeah, absolutely. Well, I so appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been so fun. Good. Yes, it's been fun for me too. And I always, you know, for myself, you know, I'm always taking in all this information because I certainly don't want dementia. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyhow, and I share all this with my husband too, because he's a little bit older than me. Um, <laughs> 
just a little bit. Anyhow, so thank you so much for being on the show and thank you all for listening. To find more information and see all of the podcasts, you can go to my website, which is lauriewilliams-seniorservices.com. We have a lot of information there and we will have Francine's info in the podcast. We always have in the podcast notes how to reach her. So we'll, we'll be putting all of that out so you'll be able to find her and give her a call. Thanks so much for listening and we'll talk to you next week. 